Good morning and happy Sabbath. Just want to welcome everyone here on this cold <laughs> winter day. Feels like winter has come back to us. Um, I want to also welcome anyone who might be joining us online. Uh, thank you for um, being with us today, even though you can't be here physically. Um, just want to welcome everyone here today, and uh, I know that you're going to be blessed by the message today. We're glad to have Pastor Will back with us. Um, if you guys would bow your heads with me for a word of prayer, then we'll begin. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for the, the cool breeze that, um, when it enters our lungs, remind us, reminds us that we're alive and, um, and gives us vigor. Uh, thank you for the Sabbath. I know that for many of us, it's been a very, very busy week. And um, I just want to thank you for your blessings uh, in my life this week. Um, I want to just pause and acknowledge that you have been really good to me. Father, we want to ask, we want to petition you on behalf of the Ukraine and her people, Lord. Please be with everyone there, Lord. Be with that situation. Um, may cooler heads prevail. And we just ask that you can work a miracle, Lord, today and on this very day, um, that the bombs will stop dropping, um, that people will stop being killed, Lord, that, that mothers are not um, chased out of the hospital where they're trying to give birth, um, that mothers and daughters aren't leaving their husbands and sons behind to fight. Lord, we need peace on this world, and we just ask that today. Please be with our message today. Um, be with Pastor Will as he brings it to us. Lord, we just ask that you will um, give him a coal from the altar, and um, may the words be his, your words, not his. We love you lots, Lord. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's Scripture reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the words of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of men as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Um, good morning and happy Sabbath. Today we are going to be singing for you um, what a beautiful name it is.
Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful music. And how true it is, the wonderful name of Jesus. That's why we are here. There's a verse, um, as they were singing, a verse came to mind that's found in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10. And it says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. So thank you for bringing that message to us in song again and that we could uh, really in our hearts resonate with the message. It's good to be with you all today. It's, uh, as Jason said in opening remarks before he prayed, it's kind of wintry weather, but it's not too bad. You know, when I was in England a few weeks ago, um, this was the kind of weather that prevailed most of the time while I was there. And then uh, the weekend that I was there, uh, there was a storm, Eunice, that was moving in across the British Isles, and it really <laughs> brought some havoc, trees down. And, but those houses in the Cotswolds area are so solid. And uh, once you're inside, you don't even hear the wind or don't even hear the rain, but it's, it's beautiful. And um, it's typical British weather. But you know, as cold as it is there, so warm are the hearts of the British people there, wonderful people in that part of England. And uh, I met quite a few uh, because the little town of Leslade, where my daughter lives, is um, only about, maybe has about 1,200 people in it altogether. So everybody knows everyone, you know. She had barely moved in there and she walked into a store and someone said, oh, you're the new person in town, you're originally from South Africa, right? And she said, how did you know that? And the person said, well, it's a small town, you know, news travels fast. Anyway, thank you, Jason, for praying for the people in Ukraine. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not always a pacifist when it comes to injustice being done in the world. Um, I cannot stand to see someone being bullied. And um, I think the pain we suffer is to just see how the world is standing by and just observing the blood shed and the devastation going on there. And it seems like the world powers aren't doing anything that's even close to being enough to stop what's happening there. And uh, that's why I want you to please continue to pray for the people in the Ukraine. But let's also pray for the people in Russia because God has children on both sides of the spectrum there. And, um, and we just need to pray, as Jason said, that God will bring peace to that part of the world. Because right now, innocents are suffering because of that. People are trapped without food, without the necessary means that they need. We need to just pray for those people. May God bless 
and may God also intervene in that part of the world. We have started a series of messages that will be addressing the 10 issues facing the church. We all watched that video a few weeks ago where Elder Mark Finley at the annual council that was conducted in Washington, D.C. last year, I believe it was in October, where he pinpointed the 10 issues that are facing the church today, one of which is how do we view the Bible? Does the Bible still have authority? Or is the Bible culturally influenced? Should we take a closer and a new look at the Bible through the lenses of our own culture? Now, when I mention the word culture, you will know that there is a certain vocabulary that is being used nowadays of cancel culture and woke culture and all the cultural trends that you can find. And what it really boils down to often is a reversal of the culture we grew up with. And this is not only happening in the world of politics, in the world of social interaction. It's also happening in the world of religion. I was reading an article and the author made this statement the other day. He was writing an article about the age of postmodernism. Now, postmodernism is just the era that started in the 19th or 20th century that is questioning everything before that. And this is what the author said. The world in which we live is changing. For the past 300 years, we have been part of an age called modernity. The modern age has now given way to a post-modern age. This transformation has changed how people view the world, how they understand the reality and truth, and how they approach the fundamental questions of life. This has had a tremendous impact on Christianity and the Bible. Unfortunately, the church in general has slowly accommodated itself to this modern trend and views of contemporary society on Scripture. So this author is raising a concern. He's, he's raising a red flag. And he says the danger is that the Bible and the message of the Bible and the preaching of the gospel is becoming influenced by this trend of modern culture, also the age of postmodernistic thinking. One aspect of the church's life needing consideration, he says, is the Bible. And then he asks, he asks these pertinent questions. Is the Bible still relevant? Can it still be trusted or is it outdated? Does biblical authority still have a place in modern Christianity? Well, when you look at the trend that's out there, if you are a Christian today and you believe in the fundamentals of the Bible, you are accused of a kind of naive realism. They say, you know, you read all these old stories that happened way back in a Mediterranean culture, and that does not have any impact or bearing upon us living in North America in 2022. Moses wrote it for the people in his day. They had the issues to deal with in their day. That has no impact on us. So indirectly, the way postmodernistic thinking is addressing the issue is they reject any kind of objective authority. There is no authority outside of us that can inform, that can instruct, or that can dictate to us how we ought to live our lives. You need to find a new kind of authority in your own cultural setting, in your own day-to-day -day living. Now, this is nothing new, because a person by the name of Milorad Pavic asserted, and he says, we have always talked of talented or gifted writers. But we should rather talk of gifted and intelligent readers nowadays. The author of what we've read should die so that the gifted reader should come to life. 
The author should finish what he has written so not as to trouble the path of the text. So what he's saying is, forget what Moses and the prophets and even the New Testament writer said. And let us put a new spin on these scriptures and see how it really appeals to us. Well, it's no wonder today that if you go online, and I don't know about you, but most of my theological books I buy on Amazon. I'm not getting paid by Amazon, so I don't want to do a commercial. I'm just saying that's sometimes the best price to get it. Even sometimes books that are termed to be out of date or not printed anymore, I still managed to find a book a while ago on Amazon that they told me was no longer printed. But it's not unusual to find books that are now all of a sudden changing the culture of the Bible. It's, no, it's, it's nothing new to find books that will address issues. Uh, so for example, I was reading a book not too long ago that is addressing the gender issue, and the author makes a statement that says, oh, you all got it wrong. All those verses in the Bible that speak against a certain gender affinity are wrong because it's within the old cultural context. You need to interpret it new through modern day culture. So indirectly, this person trying to justify a rewriting of the text to suit the new narrative of what the new trend is. And the question comes to mind, what role does the Bible play? Maybe we need to pause for a moment and ask ourselves, what authority do we have when it comes to the Bible? Turn with me to a text in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28. Because I believe the mandate that we receive from God, and I'm not speaking about pastors, I'm speaking about you as a Bible-believing Christian. The narrative that we find is in Matthew chapter 28, in the last three verses. In chapter 28 of Matthew and verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to the disciples saying, and now listen to this, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus did not say, I give you all authority. He says, all authority has been given to me. That places authority outside of the messenger. That places authority outside of the Bible writer. Jesus himself said it. And then Jesus goes on and he says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Jesus did not say go and make church members. Because a disciple is different than a church member. A church member receives the word and settles down and anchors in and says, that's it. A disciple is actively working with and for God. And Jesus never wanted people to become church members warming the pews. He wanted us to be disciples warming the hearts of people with a message of hope. So Jesus says, go there for all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the only verses where Jesus himself emphasized the Godhead. We know we don't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but we do find the three persons listed here by Jesus himself. And then it goes on, and he says, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. So our job is not to make commands. Our job is to teach. Our job is to make known. Our job is to reveal only that which Jesus has commanded. Now let us take it from here and let us look at the trend that, that, that was following because we know the roots of postmodernism is taking the Bible... And getting rid of the author because it is falsely assumed that the author is the one who originated the text. So the author cannot be trusted. So let's take the text and the reader now becomes the authority and he can read the text and he can interpret it the way he desires to. 
Now, it's sometimes very dangerous how people approach the Bible. Because there are people who would come. Um, I remember I was in my, my class on biblical hermeneutics. And the professor was saying, you know, it's dangerous how people read the Bible. For example, they will, there are people who say, well, I'm just going to open the Bible and see and put my finger and see what the text says. And the text happened to be, so Judas went and bought a piece of land and hanged himself. And he said, okay, so what is the next verse? And he turned his Bible and put it on another text. And the text says, so go and do ye likewise. You see the dilemma we run into when we do not really follow principles of interpretation. When we look at the way God intended scripture to be, and I know people sometimes think, and especially our younger people, they say, you know, we've read all these old stories of Moses and Genesis and the Exodus and yeah, we've read, this, we've read the story of Job, and we know about all the kings and all the evil they did. And yes, we read about the Syrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity. And by the way, last week, Sydney, one of our young people, of which I'm very proud, preached a wonderful message on Ezekiel and the restoration after the Babylonian captivity. Thank you for that. But the Bible deals with all these old history stories. Now, why is that? Because the book tells us, the Bible tells us all these things were written for our admonition. It happened to the people in the past and it was written for our admonition because the Bible is a unique book. What is the basis? Where did these authors get the message from? We've just noticed that Jesus is the one who has all the authority and Jesus says, I am now commanding you to go and preach the gospel. Well, let's go to a text in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. The little Old Testament book of Amos, one of the minor prophets. Amos is a little book that uh, in chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, The Lord God does nothing. Now, I want you to, to pause there for a moment. Amos 3 verse 7 says, For the Lord God, or the Sovereign Lord, some translations have it, the Sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing His plan to His servants, the prophets. Which means God is the real author, but God chose the human hand, the human mind, the human pen to record what he instructed people to do. All the people did was they recorded what God instructed them to record. Which means the, the, the argument that the, the author should really disappear so that the reader can have authority over the text does not hold ground because God is the real author. And by making the claim that we can change the text will place you in a position of authority over God himself. You will be your own God, in a sense, because you dictate your own message. Our, st our scripture this morning came from 1 Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter, chapter 1, and verse 21. And Peter makes it very clear. 2 Peter, chapter 1, and verse 21. It says, for prophecy never came by the will of man. Did you see that? It's not that Paul sat down one day and decided, well, you know, I think I better write a letter on this. No, it's not that Moses was in the desert herding the flocks of Jethro in Midian and decided one day, well, I better write a book. No, it says no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The real authority of the Bible, my friends, is never in the author that wrote the letters or the words. The real authority is in a one who inspired. So the words of the Bible never came through intuition. It always came through inspiration. 
So the question can be asked, if this is true, then the human initiative does not have any room in biblical interpretation. Because 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, the words are, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was on my tongue. The Bible authors always responded to the calling of God, to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to bring the message. But the Holy Spirit used these people to write the message using their own distinctive words, their own cultural setting, their own distinctive personality. And that's why, for example, you have four Gospels relating the same experience of Jesus yet through four different perspectives. But that does not undermine the truth about what Jesus came to do. It simply points out the experiences and the understanding that these four authors had of the Bible. Luke was never an eyewitness, but Luke in his own gospel said, O Theophilus, I have endeavored to go and do research very diligently into all these things that happened so I can write them in order to you. And that's why the Gospel of Luke is considered to be one of the most authentic of the Gospels. Not authentic in the sense that it was the only one inspired, but he wrote things in order. He did research, and he wrote things in order. So killing the author, according to what the postmodernistic view is, does not change the message. It cannot change the message, because... If you want to change the message, you have to change the messenger. And the real messenger is God. The question was asked, why then would God give us the Bible? I like the way Elder Mark Finley responded. And he said, the main purpose of the Bible is to unfold God's eternal plan of salvation to man. The main purpose, the reason why God gave us this book, is this book unfolds to us God's eternal plan of salvation. It says the Bible contains history, but yet it is not primarily a history book. The Bible touches on signs, but it is not a scientific textbook. Yes, the Bible even provides insights into the human mind, and yet it is not a treatise on psychology. The Bible instead answers three basic questions that every human being asks. First question, why am I here? Second question, where did I come from? And the third question, what does the future hold and how do I fit into that? So the Bible really is an attempt to answer the three basic questions of humanity. Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? That's life. Because these questions are the questions that we ask many times because it deals with your value, it, va it deals with your experience, it deals with your self-esteem. A lot of people feel worthless. A lot of people feel that they are just in the way. They stumbling blocks unto others. But when you read the Bible, you understand that you are not an accident. You are actually one person that God intended to live at this point in time, at this place in history. My wife and I have been reading for our evening devotions. Um, we read through the Bible, and we've just concluded the book of Esther. And Jason preached sermons on Esther not too long ago. And the one text in the book of Esther that jumps at you is when she appeared before the king and there was a threat against the Jewish nation to be all eradicated a certain time according to the evil Haman's plot. And Mordecai and Esther were having a conversation. Her uncle had raised her and he said, who knows, Esther, that just maybe God had brought you to this place for a time such as this. And I want to tell you, you are not here because of an accident. You are here because God planned you. God wants you to be here. God has a place for you. You have value. How do we know that? 
because so many people lose their value. But Peter says, beloved, I want you to know that you were not purchased with silver or gold or things of the world, but you were purchased by the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You have a value in the eyes of God. Maybe not in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of God. Every woman, every person, every child that is now dying in the Ukraine under the ferocious bombardment of a tyrant, that person is precious in the eyes of God. And that death does not go unnoticed in heaven. So why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? The reason why we as Seventh-day Adventists keep Sabbath is we reflect upon our creation. Sabbath is not just a day we chose. It's a day God said. When you come and you worship on the Sabbath, it's embedded in the fourth commandment. God says so that you can remember that in six days, God created the heavens, the earth, and everything in it, including us. So on the seventh day, we can celebrate our creation in Him. Sabbath reminds us of our identity because God created us. He created you. But Sabbath also reminds us of the value that we have in the eyes of God. And the fact that Jesus came to die for our sins and he paid the penalty. And it also reminds us of one day in heaven that we will have eternal life with Jesus. That's why we pause for this one day in the week to reflect upon those things. You know, it's interesting. When we look at the shattered lives people have in this earth. The Bible can help them to restore that. I want to show you something. <clears throat> when I was in, in England, I know my, my wife loves to build puzzles. Since her heart attack a year ago, I think it's been a therapy to her. So I, I, I bought her a puzzle, and I brought it all the way from Leslade in England. Uh, this is the puzzle, all the pieces. Okay, you see it. I think it's a thousand, honey. Is that correct? So I'm going to give her the puzzle. Say, okay, honey, now you go and build this puzzle. You put it together. You think she's able to do that? If I give her this, she's going to say to me, are you crazy? Because I need to see the picture. Now there's the picture. It's a beautiful, beautiful scene of... The river flowing through Burton on the water in the English Cotswolds. I bought it in the village where this scene is. Actually, I had the privilege to stand on that bridge with my daughter and someone took a picture of us. But this is the picture. Now, when you have the picture, do you think it's easy now to put the pieces together? Much easier because you can see, aha, that's where that piece maybe has to go. Now, I want to use this illustration to prove to you something. This is God's word. God's word is the full picture. This, you and me, our lives can be shattered, broken into pieces at times. We may not know whether we're coming or going. We might give up hope. We might lose our vision. We may just give up on life. But God says, hey, you might be a broken piece. But if you come to my word, God, with your willingness, can put your life together again. That's what the Bible means. And that's what the Bible has authority. Because someone once said, either sin will keep you from God's word, or God's word will keep you from sin. So when we come to this, this is the, this is the interesting fact that, that Paul reminds us of the very same fact. If you come with me to 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, Paul kind of frames what I've just Illustrated to you through this puzzle. When we go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Actually, we can read from verse 14. And this is Paul's counsel to young Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 14. Paul says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Notice what he says. He says, Timothy, I want you, I want you to continue. I want you to, to know that you have been informed, you've been instructed, 
You've read the scriptures from a very early age, and the more you read the scriptures, the more you, Im you immerse yourself into the word of God, the more you read about the history, the more you can place yourself within a bigger framework of God's plan and see yourself as part of history. That you should continue in the word and that you know whom you've learned it from. And concerning the Bible, he says that you, from a very young age, from childhood, have known the scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 16, Paul kind of frames what I've just illustrated here. This is what he says. For all scripture. How much scripture? All scripture. Does that include the book of Genesis and Exodus and Numbers and all those old books with a, with a list of names and an Old Testament uh, data? Yes. All Scripture is given notice by inspiration of God, not by intuition of any author. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And now he says why it's important. It is profitable for doctrine. For reproof, for instruction in righteousness and for correction. Which means I have to use the Bible like I use that book in the console of my car. There's a reason why the manufacturers put that book in the console of your car. Because it tells you what kind of pressure your tires need to be on for maximum performance for your vehicle to really operate optimally. You need to follow the instructions. If you like Harry, you can't just put castor, uh, uh, castor oil in your car. No, you need to put in a W20 or something in your car. You need to follow the guidelines because if you want your vehicle to, 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 to operate optimally, you need to follow what is in that owner's manual. And God has given us this owner's manual. That's why all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine. What's a doctrine? People always say, oh, stop talking about doctrines. Well, we can't have the Bible without doctrine because the doctrine explains what we don't understand about God. Someone once said doctrine is like the porthole in a ship. You look through this porthole and you see what's outside. It's a porthole into the heart, into the very character of God. Because of the interaction we see that God had with humanity, this tells us more about God. And that's why the devil is trying to keep us away from the Bible. Because he doesn't want us to know more about God. I want to read to you in the little book, Steps to Christ, one of my favorite books. And if you don't have this book, I really encourage you to, to really, this is a heart changer. This is not heavy doctrine. But this is a practical book that can help you in your walk with Jesus. And I found something here in the chapter on doubt. How many times we doubt God? And I want to just read to you what the author here says. And this is her take on the way that people read the Bible. She says here, There are many things apparently difficult or obscure which God will make plain and simple to those who thus seek an understanding of them. But without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we shall be continually liable to rest the scriptures or to misinterpret them. And then, this was a very shocking statement I read. She said, there is much reading of the Bible that is without profit and in many cases a positive injury. Let me read that again. There is much reading of the Bible that is without profit and in many cases a positive injury. Because when the word of God is opened without reverence and without prayer, when the thoughts and affections are not fixed upon God or in harmony with his will, then the mind is clouded with doubt. And in the very study of the Bible, skepticism strengthens. The enemy takes control of the thoughts and he suggests interpretations that are not correct. Do you remember when Jesus was in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4? The enemy came and 
the devil quoted from the book of Psalms. Why would the devil quote the Bible? Because the devil knows the Bible better than you and I do. And he can come and he can manipulate our minds by making you think that a text is saying something it does not. He tried to do it with Jesus. He twisted the words of God when he spoke to Eve in a garden. Remember, he came with the same approach. When Eve was standing at that tree, the devil came and said, Did God say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? And Eve had to think, okay, what did God say? So when the devil comes to you and he throws it at you, did God say? And you are like Eve and you think, okay, what did God say? How would you know what God said if you did not study the word? And that's where we are teetering on the borderline of deception and skepticism. Eve had to reply and say, well, God did say you cannot eat of any tree. Uh, God said we can eat of all the trees, but not of the tree in the middle, and we should not touch it. And that's exactly where she made the mistake, because she added something God never said. Right is where she stepped into the trap. So the devil is the one who can manipulate the thoughts. He can suggest interpretations that are not correct. Whenever men are not in word and deed seeking to be in harmony with God, then however learned they may be, they are liable to err in the understanding of Scripture. And it is not safe to trust their explanations. And that's why throughout the Bible, you know, we need to verify. Listen to what people say, but go and test it. Test the Bible. Even Paul, preaching to the people in Berea, says the people in Berea were more attuned to the scriptures and those in Thessalonica because not only did they receive the word that Paul presented with all willingness, but then they went and they daily, daily searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. The problem today is we rely on television preachers. We, we rely on preachers, and I'm one, I'm a preacher, and I want to encourage you and say, I am preaching the word of God, but please go and verify and read and study to see if you can agree in the Bible what I'm saying. That's why as preachers we have, we have to stand before God because we have to, to one day give account of what we preached. It might not be popular, it might not be what we always want to hear, but if God says it, I better preach it. That's why I'm here. But the message of God is a message of hope. Here is something she goes on to say. Disguise it as they may, the real cause of doubt and skepticism, in most cases, is the love of sin. Because the teachings and the restrictions of God's word are not welcome to the proud, sin-loving heart, and those who are unwilling to obey its requirements are ready to doubt its authority and in order to arrive at truth, we must have a sincere desire to know the truth and a willingness of heart to obey it. There you have it. And I believe that lies at the heart of all the misinterpretation of the Bible today. People are trying to have a biblical justification for their lifestyle. They are trying to twist and change and put a spin on a certain scripture to justify what they do. And that's why we don't hear many sermons about confession and forgiveness and a change of lifestyle. No, people don't want to change their lifestyles. This is the age we live in. They don't want to change their lifestyles. They rather want to change the Bible to justify their lifestyle. And that is a challenge that we have today. What authority does the Bible have? I thank God that... When Jesus gave the word, he gave it through the prophets, through the authors. He is still the author. He's the one who said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am not a truth. No, I am the truth. There's a very definite pronoun that sets that truth apart. It's objective. It's truth outside of me. 
because it's a truth that is in God. You know, there's a verse in Psalm 50, verse 17 and 21, that David recorded, and it says, For you yourself hate discipline, and you throw my words behind you. These things you have done, and I kept silent, God says, because you thought that I was just like you. In Psalm 50, verse 17 and 21, God says, you want to bring me down to your level. You want to make me like the next door buddy. And you think you can reason me and out-reason me. And you can, uh, you can put a spin on the word that suits your own lifestyle, your own desires. But God says, even though you thought that I was just like you, I will rebuke you and present the case before your eyes. You know why God wants us to have his word because God doesn't want our harm the reason why God is the one who gave us laws is not because God wanted to restrict our freedom it's because God knows the end from the beginning God knows if you are going to drink poison you are going to die so God tells you don't get near the poison don't even look at it don't touch it don't even Get near it because it's for your protection. And because God knows the consequence before it happens, that qualifies him to be the one giving the law. It makes sense. So the law of God is not there to restrict my freedom or to destroy my happiness. No, the law of God is there to safeguard my freedom and to guarantee my happiness. That's why. God gave us these laws. And in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7 and verse 24, we read these words. And I think that is a very fitting description of our generation and our world we live in today. Jeremiah chapter 7, 23. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. That's a desire in God's heart. God says, that's why I gave you these instructions. But what did they do? Verse 24 of Jeremiah 7, Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and the dictates of their evil hearts, and they went backward and not forward. That's the dilemma of our age. People say, you know, I don't need God's word to tell me what to do. I can just have my own form of truth. You know, and this is nothing new. Because in the year 1813 to 1855, there was a man by the name of Soren Kierkegaard. He was a Danish theologian. Now, Kierkegaard together with Jean-Paul Sartre, a Frenchman later on, philosopher, they really impact the world with a new kind of philosophical thinking, and it was called existentialism. It comes from a word to exist. And this is what Kierkegaard said. Kierkegaard said, whatever you find as truth, whatever you find as values, whatever you follow, that's you. Don't try and tell me that I need the same, because I live my life differently. Because I exist, I can choose what my values are. Because I exist, I can read the Bible, I want to read it. Because I exist, truth for you is not truth for me. I have to discover my own truth through two things, experience and interaction with others. So what is Kierkegaard saying when we cut through all the argument. He's saying, it's fine what God said. But what God said here, objectively, is not what I want, subjectively. I can just make of this what I choose, and I become my own authority. Jean-Paul Sartre was the one who followed him because... He says, because I exist, therefore I am, therefore I think, therefore I can be who I am. Which means existentialism 
is the understanding that we don't have to take absolute truth anymore. We can discover and we can work towards our own subjective truth. And that's what God warns against in Jeremiah 7. God says, I've given you my word. I want you to obey my voice. I want you to follow what I've instructed you to do, that it may go well with you. But you refused. Instead, you inclined your ear to your own thinking and the own evil dictates of your heart. That is existentialism. And God says, instead of going forward, you went backward. Let me ask you, is the world a happy place today? Is the world a good place today? Is the world a safe place today? And yet, the world out there would like us to believe that we are on track for a better world. God's word says, the last days will be evil. Paul says the time will come when people will no longer endure sound doctrine. But because they have itching ears, they will follow the dictates of their hearts and fables. It's exactly what God's word predicted. God's word has authority to safeguard our safety, to safeguard our freedom, to safeguard our moving forward. Throw God's word out. And we're going backward and not forward. Let me conclude with the words of Jesus. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 in his prayer. And he prayed for you and me. I want you to know that. Isn't it wonderful to think that God, Jesus prayed for you? Listen to what he says. John chapter 17. And in verse 17 he prayed, Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for yours and for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. So what is Jesus saying? He says, Father, I pray that your word will govern their walk with you. I pray that... There will be a kind of people that will be separate from the world, but they will be people of God. I pray that you will sanctify them by your truth. Your word is a truth. And then he says, I sent them in the world. And then he continues, says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And that brings us to the situation we have. God is praying for us, but he's praying for us to be in his truth. He's praying for us to be in the word. In Psalm 25, this is a prayer of David. The New Living Translation, and I'm going to conclude with this. Just listen, follow. Psalm 25, verse 4 through to 9, in a New Living Translation. Show me the right path, O God. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of of your unfailing love. I like that, don't you? For you are merciful, O Lord. The Lord is good. He does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them His way. Let us pray. Father, lead us in your word. Lead us by your truth. O oh, Father, I pray that you give us a willingness to surrender to you. I pray that you give us a mind and a heart that be sensitized to the working of your Holy Spirit and to the scripture as we read it for our correction, for our reproof, for our instruction in righteousness. Lord, we live in an age of relativism where people want to subject the scripture to their own inclination of heart, 
to their own mindset. They want to kill the messenger so they can change the message. Lord, help us as your people to stand by the firm expression, Thus saith the Lord. And may your word indeed be the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. In Jesus' name, amen.